it's incredible how in certain part of the countries they are completely unspoiled. You can see mountains, green fields, animals and very uh, little houses of people around. You, you wouldn't expect it from, from a country that's so close to, to you. When you start visiting them and you start seeing the different shades of their cultures and their lifestyle, you find the characteristic that actually makes all of them unique. Caucasus is a place which is absolutely full of history, as it testified by different cultures, different religions, different languages and different alphabets. We started in Baku, the main city of Azerbaijan. We had very low expectation on Baku. Um, everyone says that this is like a sort of Dubai of the Caspian Sea. Uh, the reality is much better than Dubai. Right now we are in the old city, which is preserved within the walls and dates back from the medieval period. Very nice to walk, uh, a little bit touristic, but uh, very enjoyable. The second part of the town is outside the walls, it's the European city which was built in the late 19th and uh, early 20th century and was built out of the oil boom. So a lot of Europeans came here and they built a, a city with a European flavour. And then there is the third part of the city where absolutely new uh, steel and glass uh, buildings are replacing the old Soviet ones. In that context, the famous and iconic the flame towers are now the symbol of Baku. And to avoid feeling too far away from the rest of Europe, they decided to create a mini Venice. Then we visit the Asperon Peninsula, which is characterized mainly by fire, petrol, which is what is making that land unique. Azerbaijan means land of fire, and this is because they have a lot of like oil and gas just laying underneath the ground and you can see one of the example in the burning mountain and that that fire is actually everlasting even if when it rains it never really stops We're in the Kobustan area, which is 80 kilometers south of Baku, where you can find these mud volcanoes, which are actually quite entertaining. So we are in the Absheron Peninsula, near Baku, and we are visiting a Zoroastrian temple. Zoroastrian was the, the religion of the fire, a very important religion, one of the main ones, and was the religion of Persia, and obviously Azerbaijan, because it's the land of fire and many, many natural fires, but a sort of holy land, a sort of uh, land where the pilgrims will visit. We're leaving Baku, we're going towards Tbilisi, and of course, instead of like actually getting like a very comfortable cab, Giuliano decided to catch a fantastic, like, Russian-style train. So we just get into our, into our train. Looks everything nice, except it's extremely hot. Probably like 50 degrees. Just arrived in Tbilisi. We are in Tbilisi, and this time we're going to take it easy because we've been here last year. What we're going to do? We're going to explore the areas that we haven't managed to see last time. We are actually 
based at the Fabrica, which is um, artistic space, as you can see, there are all the graffitis, and it also uses restaurants, bars, and hotels. For example, we went to the Cajetiri region, which is a wine region, and I have to say that Guillermo actually enjoyed a very powerful wine tasting, something around like 10, 10 30 in the morning, where the story was getting to the, the wine producer and start drinking every drink kind of wine. So Guillermo had a very good time. So we are now exploring the Kakheti region in Georgia, which is very famous for its wine. We are actually visiting a, a winery. The visit here consists of a number of shots of wine, red and white, six or seven, plus a brandy in the end, which is 40 degrees. And it is just 10 a.m. in the morning. We are in the city of Signaki, in the region of Kakheti, and it's definitely really hot. After that, we rented a car and we went from Tbilisi to Yerevan. And just right after the border, we had the opportunity to taste what Armenia would have been like, visiting two main monasteries of an incredible beauty. And we left Tbilisi this morning. Our destination is Yerevan. The first step is obviously the border, which shouldn't be far. The roads in Armenia are not as good as in Georgia, actually. Um, we are now just in a tunnel and it's quite tough. We're going south to Yerevan and we are stopping along the way to visit some of the beautiful monasteries. This one here is the one of Akpat uh, in its beautiful monastery complex that dominates the Debet Canyon, which is behind us and which we are uh, going through uh, by car. is the monastery of San uh, which is uh, not far from the industrial town of Alabe. We are in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, and we're going to spend here four days. Once we got to Yerevan, we actually managed to meet a very old schoolmate of mine, Narek, who is originally Armenian. He gave us his, um, his view of what is Armenia now and what it could be in the future. You guys came here to Armenia for the first time. Hope you're enjoying it. Welcome to Armenia. <laughs> I'm living in Armenia right now, but I'm new to Armenia. I was born in France. I grew up in Italy. And then I moved to Canada when I was 25 years old. Uh, for me, every part of me, or every part of culture that I absorbed over the years is an important part of me. And now I'm here. Uh, I'm here in this so-called New Armenia. It's called New Armenia because we just had a revolution. Not many people know about it. It's called this, uh, Velvet Revolution because it happened very peacefully. I moved here at a very exciting time because right now Armenia is going through some major changes and uh, all the previous corruption that was here, that was the main feature of this country, apparently is slowly uh, dismantling somehow. And uh, a great need to, to redesign, reshape our old values as what does it mean? 
what it means to be Armenian nowadays. Change will be slow, it's normal, but it's happening. So right now in Yerevan, there's a lot of energy, good energy. Very happy that at this point in my life, I'm here. In Yerevan, I was really impressed by the cascade, which is like a, 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 an immense staircase uh, on, over a hill overlooking the entire city. You can watch beautiful sunset from there. It is an art center and there is a lot of art both inside and outside. And I love it because it is a very lively place, very enjoyable and very romantic as well. On 15th of July, we are enjoying the final of the World Cup. It's France against Croatia. Uh, Yerevan, uh, very interesting. The country landlocked, you would expect a city in the middle of nowhere basically to be so lively, actually, people uh, to enjoy life so, so, so much. It really, it really comes alive at night and evening. They eat late, they go out, you will see people around. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Armenia has two main assets that we offer to tourism. One is the amazing monasteries that are dating back thousands of years, and the second one is the incredible landscape. This is the monastery of Noravank, uh, which is one of the very famous in the central part of Armenia. But the most amazing thing here is probably the setting, the landscape, which is absolutely astonishing. a classical Armenian kachka is a carved uh, cross in a stone and usually is posed above a sun that represents eternity. The Armenian church is uh, it's one of the Orthodox churches but it's totally it's on its own. We were the first Christian nation. They adopted Christianity 10 years before Rome did. So it was 303 instead of 313. The monastery behind me is the monastery of Korvira, which is probably one of the most pictured. The reason is because behind it you can see the Mount Ararat. Actually right now it's difficult to see because it's cloudy. The border between Armenia and Turkey is just a few kilometers far away. Historically it's a very important monument for the Armenian because the region across the border was historically inhabited by Armenians. Armenians have been spread throughout the world for centuries. The formal Armenia, but it's just a tiny part of the actual historic lands where Armenia used to live. So we're on our way to Lake Savan and we just found the caravanserai which actually reminded us that we're on the Silk Road. And if you look at it, it is actually a closed caravanserai because it's a mountain pass so it was actually quite cold over here. We are at the Lake Sawan, one of the highest lakes in the world. We are at the 2,000 meters above the sea level. During one of the visits of one of the many monasteries that we, we've seen, we met Giorgio, who is a half Italian, half Georgian guy, who gave us like a beautiful understanding of the Armenian monastery. Hello, I'm Daniela Giorgio. I'm a student of the University of Engineering and Architecture of Trento in Italy. I'm fond of Caucasian uh, churches and monasteries and medieval architecture. And this is one of my favorite places, is our Harichabank Monastery in the region of Shirak near Gyumri. It has two elements that are very interesting. One is the dome, the umbrella dome, and another one is the gavit, this, this part of structure before the church. This gavit often were added to the church later and uh, uh, they take inspired from the concept of the countryside uh, traditional Armenian house in which there is a hole with a dome, a wooden dome with a hole for make the smoke of the fire go out. We were just 
just passing by, we saw this man selling like watermelon. We thought like, why not try one of those? Because it's really hot and this is actually very nice. We are at the Gagard Monastery, 40 kilometers out of Yerawan. It was built in the 4th century. So we just arrived in Garni, which is not a church, it's not a monastery, but it's a proper pagan temple. It's quite unique because it was built roughly 2,000 years ago. We're done with Armenia, so we had to drive back to, to Georgia and we directed ourselves to Bartia, which again, Guglielmo and I saw last year already. But this time it was a bit more, uh, we were a bit more lucky with the weather. It was sunny and it was good to just visit the site again. Today we are in Bartia, a medieval city carved out uh, of rocks. Um, the city was originally a monastery. Uh, it was destroyed by earthquake in the 13th century and looted by Persian 200 years uh, after. Um, the city was abandoned in the last uh, in the last years, and is sitting beautifully on a, a valley of the uh, river Matvari. After visiting many churches and monasteries. We finally visit in uh, a castle called Ketvisi. We are in Oblisike, which is the same city similar to Bardia, but it's definitely older than that one and it has been abandoned during the medieval times. Stop in Gori, which is a town in Georgia, which is famous because here is the native place of Joseph Stalin. We just visited the museum, which is quite interesting because there is a lot of pictures and memorabilia. Uh, although actually it is interesting to notice that there is no mention at all of anything uh, around the Gulag and the kind of the bad things that, that happens. We moved on to Kutaisi that is another one of the main cities in Georgia. We are the Gelati Monastery, which has been one of the uh, main religious and culture place back in the days. Compared to the Armenian mon monasteries, the Georgian ones, they are characterized by a lot of frescoes, which is absolutely breathtaking. Driving in the Caucasus has been pretty tough, but in particular has been challenging in Georgia driving with a number of uh, cows, really hundreds and hundreds of cows, not even in India I saw so many. The fact that I have so many cows is the reason why the Georgian has amazing, amazing cheese. The things that they've done is that they combine cheese and bread and they created the kachapuri, which is a meal that I think will be popular all over Europe in the next five years. Canterbury is very good, but don't stay here for too long because you're going to put a lot of weight on <laughs> and you will go back home shabby. You will find food 
they are more common to Europe and some other are more common to Asia, but they are incredibly mixed in, in, the, in the local cuisine. Finally, we went to see the Black Sea, which pretty much concluded our coast to coast from the Caspian to the Black Sea. We completed our coast to coast, we arrived on the Black Sea. Caucasus historically always had an important place on the Silk Roads, always connected the East and the West. And in recent years, with the new investments that are deployed on the Silk Road, it will place, I think, Caucasus back in the map again and will be a focal point in the trade and in the connection between China and Europe.